Hello, welcome to analysis of direct to package 224 gig channels. So today we'll be talking about direct to package channels. And specifically, uh, we're looking at 224 gigabit per second. So welcome to everybody. My name is Michael Rollins. I'm an SI engineering manager at Amphenol designing connectors. Uh, just finished a lot of 112 gig designs and now we're developing 224 gigabit per second products. So we'll go over overpass, why overpass and why on package. And then we'll cover the channel components used in this analysis. We'll discuss the channel configurations, go over some metrics. Then we'll look at results. Um, we'll look at trade-offs and comparisons of different features of the channels. And then we'll have a summary and conclusions. So why overpass, why on package for channels? So uh, at the top of the screen is a sketch of a general channel. We've got a circuit board, a chip on the circuit board. There's trace to a IO panel connector. There's a module plugs into the connector or a cable assembly. And for a cable assembly, it's basically taking this structure and then repeating it. So it goes from the chip to the cable assembly and then back to the chip through the same components a second time. Module, mating interface, connector, trace, chip. So with an overpass construction, the circuit board trace and the IO connector are replaced with an overpass structure. In this case, it's a, a twin X cable to a near chip connector. And then for on package, the circuit board trace and connector uh, are replaced with a twin X cable direct to package. So the connection from the chip to the circuit board is replaced with this on package connector. So the, the on package path is the most favorable for 224. It's, it's the highest performance that I've seen because it eliminates a lot of the interface. It goes directly to the, the chip that's generating the, the signal as, as quickly and easily as possible. And basically the near chip overpass replaces trace with cable and saves loss. The on package overpass replaces trace with cable, but it also eliminates vias and pads. So it saves loss and reflections. Here are a few sketches of channel configurations. Uh, these are the structures that we'll go over today. Uh, the one at the top is the traditional PCB trace. Um, you know, it's a chip attached to a circuit board and then trace to a connector and then a module plugs into a connector. In all of these cases, instead of a module plugging in, it could be a cable assembly. But to simplify the picture, uh, these are all drawn with modules. The overpass structure with a near chip looks like this. There's a IO connector direct to twin X cable. That's the same panel mating interface in all three. So the connector goes to a twin X, which goes to a near chip connector. The near chip connector attaches to the circuit board. So there's a short section of trace and vias to go from the near chip to the chip. With the overpass on package structure, the connector is in the panel, goes direct to twin X. And then the on package connector goes directly to the chip so there's a, there's a whole set of vias and traces and pads that are eliminated, including the chip to PCB uh, attach, typically uh, some kind of a BGA attach. Here's a sketch of a bump-to-bump -bump channel. So in all of these cases, there's a, uh, in, in the paper, there's a model from bump to bump. So this is the, the most detail that 
that I have available for uh, a channel configuration. Uh, so it's directly from the, the die bump through a package structure and then through the uh, channel. Uh, the sketch here is shown with a direct to package uh, attach. So this is coming down uh, directly onto the top surface of the package. And then there's a, a circuit, uh, excuse me, a substrate package structure that goes to the die bump. Uh, this snapshot is from a Densilink product uh, and it goes from the surface of the package to a twin X structure. And then in this case to a OSFP overpass panel connector. And then that includes a mating interface, uh, the module or uh, cable assembly transition is modeled with uh, one inch of trace and then a cable termination structure. Uh, the module is, is just uh, modeled with uh, two inches of trace and then a you know, cable, uh, excuse me, a, a chip attached structure in the module. That's where the, the module model ends. In this case, we see a external cable assembly. And so each of these pieces is repeated on the way back to uh, the second chip. This is a snapshot of a measurement. So in the upper left corner is a picture of the overpass assembly. So in this case, it's a Densilink attached to a test board and then twin X to uh, an OSAP overpass module. And the test board structure, uh, something like this, uh, sketch on the bottom. There's a Densilink test board. Densilink snaps directly to the board and that connects to the coaxial test fixtures. Then there's a twin X structure to a panel connector. And then there is a test board that plugs in to the panel connector, uh, which provides a, a coax measurement access on that side. So, so this measurement, this uh, green and red line uh, are measured data uh, from this kind of uh, overpass structure. So this is a raw measurement, including the test fixture attached and trace, and then the overpass assembly and the test fixture on the other side. So the point here is we're seeing pretty good uh, measurement results compared to what we expect. Uh, we've got fairly smooth loss out to some frequency and then you know, at higher frequencies, we do see some, some wiggle, um, but this is performing uh, as expected, and we do have um, you know, overpass structures that were built. In this channel analysis, everything is going to be analyzed at 224, and the, the idea is that there are all of these components to the channel, and we can mix them and uh, use different pieces to build uh, a wide range of channels. So the components are a trace structure, the overpass twin X, uh, an overpass panel connector, and that's compared to a surface mount panel connector. And then the external twin X structure, there's a BGA model uh, that's part of the chip attach for the channels that have a chip attach. Uh, the BGA model is eliminated in the on package structure. Uh, there's cable termination structure, and then there's the Densilink near chip connector uh, and the Densilink on package connector. So those those uh, Densilink structures are a little bit different depending on whether it's used in an on package structure or a near chip. So the components shown here are what I call the lo the loss per length components. They're fairly smooth, simple uh, models that just have loss that uh, increases with length. So we've got a strip line structure, overpass, external twin X. Uh, the BGA structure is the cyan color. And then there's two uh, different uh, package structures. There'll be a little bit more detail later on those two. The main idea here is that if we're looking at 53 gigahertz as the Nyquist frequency, right around here, uh, the 
you know, the overpass twin ax is uh, shorter segments. It, it, it's not a huge amount of loss in this uh, comparison. Uh, strip line is a little bit more loss. The BGA uh, definitely, you know, adds some, some noticeable loss. Um, you know, th this is uh, an estimate, uh, a guess for 224. And, uh, you know, th those 224 models are constantly uh, under development. So this could change. This is um, an estimate. Um, it, it does contribute uh, noticeably to the loss. And it has this roll off that's that's more severe than uh, these other uh, structures. And then the two different package uh, structures have different loss per length. Uh, I'll go into that later. And then the external twin ax per, you know, it's the longest uh, physical structure. So it has a noticeable amount of loss for a one meter structure. You know, but you, we can imagine, you know, if it's half a meter, it's, it's half of this uh, red line. The interfaces and connectors are, those components are summarized on this slide. Um, the, you know, the main point here is that anything with the you know, interface and a uh, discontinuity, that's going to have more uh, reflections and more loss deviation. So these are not as smooth as the, the loss per length components on the previous slide. Um, the Dense link on package structure is this red line. So it's very, very short electrically. It's so small um, that it uh, has a fairly smooth uh, loss curve. Uh, then the, the dense link near chip is the surface mount component. It has a, a bit more wiggle, a little bit more loss. And then the, the cable termination, uh, you can see has some roll off above 60 uh, gigahertz. Um, the, the OSFP overpass structure has some loss deviation, fairly low uh, straight line uh, loss. And then the SMT structure is a connector structure with a mating interface. It's the longest electrical path because it goes through a right angle, starts at the surface of the board and goes through a right angle. So it's physically longer. That's why it has the longest, uh, the highest um, straight line loss and it it has fairly smooth loss to uh, you know 65 gigahertz and then it has some roll off uh, so the point here is that you know at 224 we're looking at really high frequencies uh, around 53 gigahertz as the Nyquist there's always going to be some reflections and some wiggle to the loss curves because of the way the mating interfaces are defined and uh, for channel and uh, system performance, anything we can do to reduce those discontinuities and make the mating interfaces physically smaller, that's going to help these curves and help the overall channel. Uh, you know, I'll go back to this slide, you know, for the loss, uh, for length components, the, you know, anything we can do to reduce loss is positive and anything we can do to reduce the length, you know, is also going to reduce the loss in the overall channel. So let's go through some of the components, share a little bit of detail. So the overpass connector, it's got uh, you know, standard uh, OSFP mating interface that's defined in specification. And then it directly attaches to twin X coming out the, the backside. And the summary here shows loss, reflections, near end crosstalk and uh, far end crosstalk. So, you know, you can see that the, the, the loss on, you know, on this scale is fairly low. There are some wiggles to it. The reflections basically tell the same story as the, the loss curve. You know, when the reflections are low enough, they really don't have much effect on the loss curve, but it, you know, as they get above 10 dB, start to have some uh, effect on the on the loss curve, we can see the energies going into reflections. And then the crosstalk curves, you know, main idea here is the crosstalk is, is, is low, low enough to work in a channel, but uh, with the mating interface, you know, it is uh, building up to some noticeable numbers around minus 40 dB at uh, 40 gigahertz. The uh, surface mount, connector snapshot is here. 
Uh, again, there's a standard mating interface, the plug side, and then it goes through a, a right angle structure to attach to the board. Uh, the loss curve and reflections curve are here, and the crosstalk is you know, similar to the uh, overpass. If we skip back and forth, the crosstalk's a little bit higher for a surface mount structure because it's electrically longer, a little bit more distance for the crosstalk to build up. Uh, the near chip connector looks like this. Uh, it has two pieces, has a you know the Densilink cable piece, and then there's a small surface mount piece that goes on to the uh, board surface. And that's the near chip structure. There's a, a small surface mount piece. Uh, again, we can see the loss, reflections, and crosstalk. The crosstalk is uh, low enough, um, but it does you know tend to build up at uh, higher frequencies. And the on-package tensile link is very similar, except it doesn't have a second piece. It goes uh, directly to the uh, surface of the package. Uh, there's no other components, it just goes directly down onto it. And you can see the on package structure, there is lower crosstalk than with the surface mount structure. And the, the loss is a little bit lower. The reflections are nice, nice and low, but below minus 10 dB all the way out to 90 gigahertz in the simulation. So we're, uh, we're comfortable with the reflections performance and the, and the crosstalk performance is, is lower than some other structures. So it's another reason that this on package structure is uh, favorable for 224 channels. The package and BGA models are shown here. So the BGA model is uh, just a lumped model with um, two capacitors and uh, inductor basic pi filter. Um, these are fair. These are very low capacitances, but they are they are noticeable um, on this red line here. Um, you know, it's adding one or two dB of loss in a in a forty to sixty gigahertz range. So it's it's really nice to eliminate that from the structure. The package model is a trace to a die bump, and the results of that simulation are here in the blue and green. The main point here is that the skip layer structure uh, uses a double height dielectric so that the trace can be twice as wide with half the loss. So the standard strip line would be L3 signal, L4, L2, layer two and four reference. But the skip layer uses the L3 signal, but the reference is layer one and layer five. That larger structure is in the blue line here, and it has uh, much lower loss. It's you know approximately twice the width of the trace. It's half the loss. It's a little bit, little bit uh, more than half the loss. It doesn't quite get to half the loss, but but there's a significant improvement here. Uh, this will show up in the channel results as a as a noticeable benefit, especially when there's a cable assembly model that has has two of these uh, models in the path. Uh, this chart is a summary of a bunch of different channel configurations. You know, it is an eye chart, so the main point is not to read all of it, but to see that there are many different combinations. And this is a set, you know, a set of uh, 12 or 13 or 14 channels that I think are interesting. You know, ranging from the kind of the the best best possible channel given these models to um, you know, much, much lossier channel uh, that's kind of on the edge of what might work. Uh, so here's a summary of the bump to bump uh, channel loss. So this is the STD21 plots of all the files shown on the previous slide. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a grouping up here, uh, which are, you know, yeah, uh, C to M, chip to module structures. So these are much shorter paths, simpler. They don't have an external cable. So that's the grouping up here. And the lowest loss path is a skip layer package, the lowest package loss, 
and then an on package connection, and then a sh an overpace, overpass assembly, and then directly to the module that plugs in. So that's the shortest uh, path um, and the lowest loss path. And down here, starting with the black line, that, that's a grouping of structures that have an external cable. So it was one, it was one millimeter, excuse me, one meter external cable, 1.5 meters, it's in there. And then the, the, the two high loss paths uh, are uh, with the standard package, you know, the higher, higher loss package structure with uh, the chip BGA, either a near chip or traditional PCB. And then uh, that's going to uh, a surface mount connector in one case or uh, overpass connector and then to a one meter external cable. Oh, I'll highlight these markers I put in there. So, you know, minus 35 dB is an estimate for the maximum loss of 53 gigahertz that a channel can handle bump to bump. So that, you know, that that's a, an estimate based on some preliminary uh, chip information, CERTES information. So there's, you know, that line is drawn here. The, there's a handful of channels that are that are pushing that limit. Uh, you know, minus 30 uh, or, or less loss is considered to be uh, a, a nice number. You know, the channel's very likely to be able to handle that. So there's a set of, a set of channels that would hit this 30 dB target. Most of these that hit 35 dB target. And there is a few that are beyond that target that would probably create additional stress for the channel. Uh, for reflections, this is a scatter plot of all the reflections. Pretty much all the paths have good reflections. Uh, the near chip and PCB solutions have slightly higher reflections. If you squint and stare at uh, the model, you might be able to see some of the blue and black lines with lower reflections, and you know the red and, and gray and green uh, have a little bit higher reflections. But all of these are are good, kind of based on my uh, interpretation and uh, typical metrics. The near-end crosstalk looks like this. Uh, all of this near-end crosstalk is relatively low, and uh, the integrated noise uh, over the frequency range is pretty low. Um, the near-chip solutions have some uh, energy bumps still below minus 40 dB peaks, but that's the, the excess energy compared to most of the results. That's from the, the near chip structure, which is another reason that it's nice to have an unpackaged structure to, to avoid this. For far end, there's more of a range. You know, it's all of these, again, all of these results are uh, pretty good and you know, within range of what's acceptable for 224. Uh, some of the higher far end crosstalk is just because it's a shorter path, lower loss, less attenuation, but also the surface mount structure um, at the panel has higher crosstalk than the overpass structure. Uh, the near trip structure has higher uh, crosstalk than on package. And uh, you know, the, the highest loss channels are, are challenging on the loss curve, but they, they attenuate the far end crosstalk nicely. So you see some of the blue and the gray lines down here, which are lower on far end crosstalk. So now let's, let's take all this pile of data and look at some uh, results and try to summarize to some metrics. Again, all of the 224 discussion is preliminary. So these are estimated metrics uh, you know, nothing has been uh, decided or uh, uh, approved in the specification. Uh, these numbers change every week. So it's an estimate, uh, you know, based on where we're at right now. Uh, so you can see that the ICN ILD settings include the data rate, the integration frequencies, rise time, and the loss deviation has similar metrics. Uh, or similar inputs, you know, start and stop frequency, rise time, and then the 
uh, ERL effective return loss has these settings and rise time and uh, number of uh, UI units and a, a few other uh, settings which can be uh, studied in the channel operating margin documentation. Uh, but anyway, this is a snapshot of the metrics that are used to, to get some numbers to put with those curves. So this is what the results look like uh, for the channels that were analyzed. Uh, this is approximately starting at the lowest loss channel and going to the higher loss channels. So for um, the loss at 53 gigahertz and 35 dB is a target, uh, typical ERL target uh, is uh, 11 dB. And then uh, typical integrated crosstalk for far end is 3.6 millivolts, typical for near end 1.4 millivolts. Again, these are all preliminary estimated metrics. Uh, I, the color coding is green is a, a nice, good, uh, strong number. No, no concerns about these metrics. Um, and then yellow is you know, uh, some concern about the metrics. And then red is, is something that's you know, past the, the target metric. So you can see at the, at the bottom are these three channels that are higher loss than this, this minus 35 dB target. Um, you know, those are near trip and traditional uh, circuit board structures with external cable. That's what pushes the loss past the limit. Um, there's a set of external cable assembly uh, results that are uh, acceptable with these targets. They're they're getting close to the limit, but they're but you know they're they look promising and something to work with. And so these are external cable assemblies with either really short uh, circuit board and and low loss package structures, or with an on package structure plus uh, external cable. You can see that the you know the loss is in question, but uh, these other metrics, reflections and, and crosstalk look pretty good uh, for these uh, on package structures. And I also wanna highlight in this analysis, the uh, one of the best cases for uh, external cable is right here, you know, low loss package structure, uh, on package overpass configuration, and then external cable 1.5 meters. So the so 1.5 meters for 224, looks possible, looks like it's it's in the range of, of what's feasible uh, given these kind of preliminary targets. And then uh, the, all these chip to module channels look very favorable. They, they all look pretty good you know, with these metrics. It looks like those will work. Um, with anything with external cable and a near trip structure or external cable and a circuit board structure, it looks looks pretty pretty challenging. Uh, so that's, you know, that's part of what um, I think the data is pointing to uh, on package structures. Um, but, uh, you know, there's continuing discussions and debate about that. The, the circuit, traditional circuit board structures definitely have value as something simple. So if the paths are short enough, um, you know, I don't know if uh, four inches of trace is feasible, um, but in the simulation, you know, four inches from the chip to the panel connector, with an external cable one meter, it looks like it's in the range of, of what's feasible. So taking these different channels and looking at some of the trade-offs and numbers, uh, this is the result that I thought about. So I'm starting with the, the best lowest loss path, you know, that's a zero, kind of a zero penalty baseline and that's a minus 13 dB uh, at 53 gigahertz uh, reference loss. So switching to a standard package that's you know 2 dB penalty uh, per package, so it would be 4 dB penalty in a cable assembly structure. The near chip uh, compared to the the reference on package, that's about a, you know a 3 dB penalty. The BGA plus circuit board plus connector effects. Um, and those effects are broken out here. So it's PCB trace is 1.2 dB 
and penalty per inch compared to an overpass structure. Uh, the near chip surface mount connector is about half a dB compared to the on package structure. The VGA adds about one dB per chip. The SMT connector is about one dB per connector compared to the overpass baseline. External twin axe is about 0.6 dB per 100 millimeter length. And uh, overpass twin axe is about 1.6 dB uh, per 100 millimeter length. So the overpass twin axe is, is smaller, physically smaller, thinner. So it's uh, about twice the loss per length, uh, but it fits, fits nicely into tight spaces. And typically the overpass structure is, is much shorter than the uh, external twin axe. So if we put all these numbers together from the channel results and the kind of component uh, penalties or component loss factors at 53 gigahertz, here are a bunch of channels that are right at the 35 dB target. So in this case, I said, okay, what, what's the maximum external length given a short overpass and all the best uh, on package you know, skip layer uh, structure. So in this case, uh, there is a path to uh, two meter external length if everything else is the best. Uh, and that's right at 35 dB. So uh, for a circuit board structure, I said, okay, well, what's using the, the calculator and the configurator, what's, what's the maximum circuit board length for a tip to module structure given the best of everything else? So in this case, it'd be 20 inches of circuit board trace, uh, which is, that's a significant number. That, that's something that we can work with. Uh, here's a structure for uh, what's the maximum external cable with the uh, best uh, circuit board structure. Well, if the four inches of PCB works and all the other pieces are the, the best configuration, then it looks like one and a half meters might be possible. Um, again, you know, this four inches seems like it, it might be an extreme number to try to get all the signals to fit in that, but, uh, but this is an example uh, limit. Uh, the maximum PCB trace for a half a meter external is uh, nine inches. The maximum unpackage overpass, so what's the maximum overpass length for a chip to module structure. So, so actually that was interesting given, um, given these numbers, the, the overpass could get quite long, you know, 1.75 meters uh, in a chip to module structure, which again, seems like an extreme number, but that's, um, you know, that looks like there's plenty of space for, for wiring uh, if, if the, inside the box overpass needs to be really long uh, for a chip to module structure. Uh, so what's the, you know, kind of what's the best or what's the longest uh, overpass structure given a near chip? Well, the near chip penalty in this case is about 0.25 meters. So the, the structure calculated to 1.5 meters overpass. And then um, external cable using near chip with the best of everything else, it looks like uh, you know, the shortest overpass uh, could provide for 1.25 meter external cable and a near chip. And then the uh, maximum uh, external cable assembly structure for a PCB uh, given a standard package without the skip layer benefit would be a little bit less than one meter. So, uh, you know, a couple of the highlights here, it looks like chip to module structures look reasonable for, for all three configurations, circuit board, near chip, and on package. Uh, for the external cable, um, you know, it looks like it's, it's gonna be pretty tough for a traditional circuit board to support one meter of external cable at 224. Uh, but with the, on package structure, uh, in the best case, it looks like maybe two meters external is, is feasible. And certainly 1.5, one meter are uh, 
pretty solid choices for uh, an on package structure. So here is a summary of what we've talked about and some conclusions. Uh, in this analysis, it looks like uh, traditional PCB channels can work at 224 if the trace length is, is very short. Uh, the external cable looks like there's a path possibly to two meters if the overpass constructions are used. And uh, looks like a, a reasonable maximum is about 0.5 meters if uh, traditional PCB constructions are used. Uh, the near chip configurations don't look that promising, kind of added complexity without a lot of uh, added uh, benefit. Uh, the on package configurations look pretty good. Uh, the BGA attach is a significant degradation. So anything that can be done to improve or eliminate that is valuable. Uh, the skip layer package definitely shows uh, a significant improvement in loss that's valuable uh, for the channel um, if, there's, if there's space for it in the package. And in general, uh, 224 channels can work with passive copper in uh, precise configurations. And uh, like many people have said, at, at 224 gigabits per second, all the little things matter. The, the package trace and the BGA and you know a, a few millimeters of cable length can make a difference via tuning, pad reflections. All of these details are are really important, and you know we'll have to continue working on each of the components in the path uh, in order to uh, get more performance. So it's not just one component that we can focus on and say, oh, we make this twin X better, then uh, everything gets better in the channel. It's like each of the components needs. Uh, attention and focus in order to make 224 work. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I think we have some time for questions.